This is a Main Hustle Media Podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Jackie O and you're listening to Militantly Mixed. Yo, this is Rashani from the Single Simulcast. And when I'm not making you laugh or making up parody songs, I'm kicking back listening to Militantly Mixed. I would like to acknowledge that the Militantly Mixed podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the Karankawa people, and I wish to pay my respects to the people of that nation, both past and present. Hey y'all, welcome to Militantly Mixed, the podcast about race and identity from the mixed race perspective. I am your host, Charmaine, aka Mixed Girl Maine, the Busiest mixed race bisexual polyamorous atheist comic book nerd cat mom mask making Gulf Coast Cosmos comic book co owning Asian American Podcasters Association's Golden Crane Award winning podcaster in this podcasting game. I only have a couple more months to say that because next year's winners will be next year's winners. And I mean, we'll always be a winner, but you know, I can retire it after the new award ceremony. Uh, This is episode 145, and my guest today is Sadie. For those of you that are Patreon sponsors above the $5 level, Sadie's video dropped on Friday, not last Tuesday. Uh, Last Tuesday, or last week, ended up being a crazy busy week at Gulf Coast Cosmos, which was a really, really great thing. And because of that, things got behind, so I wasn't able to upload the video. I think I did it on Friday. It may have been Saturday, but it was at least before this episode aired, so that's what's important. Part of the reason why we were so busy at the shop is because we were featured on a local news station, KHOU, in their morning show called H-Town Rush. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to share the audio from the video that aired for the Houston H-Town Rush. Looking for a hero in Houston. Well, now there's a new place to find those heroes. If you're a fan of comics or fan art or collectibles, there's a comic bookstore in town that you'll want to check out. Gulf Coast Cosmos just opened doors on a brand new shop right outside of downtown Houston. And as Brittany Ford explains, it's no coincidence they chose the third ward to call home. In the heart of the Third Ward is a place. We have Marvel in here. Jon Snow is able to uh, channel his inner superhero. This is um, another one of my favorite comic book heroes because of representation. And if you look around, you'll notice just that. Black and brown superheroes on comic book covers, posters, and even toy figures. And the faces that'll meet you at the door. And then he Charmaine said, Fury and Byron <laughs> Kennedy. I was sad and I was like, man, I just wish there was a space like this that was for us, black and brown geeks and nerds. That was, that was all we ever wanted. The two have created just that as co owners of Gulf Coast Cosmos Comic Shop. Operating as a pop-up shop on Elgin Street for the last six months, they've now opened their first brick-and-mortar shop just blocks away from that location. To service people that look like us and give them what little Charmaine and little Byron did not have. Fostering representation on all fronts. For me, it is the... It's the giving back to the community that helped shape me. And a space where people like Snow can get lost in the pages. Put yourself in the shoes of your favorite hero. Close to home. It's very motivated to see something different, especially in Third Ward. Brittany Ford. It's the little comic book shop that can. KHOU 11 News. And so in addition to that segment airing on the news, and I think they reran it like in the evening too, um, because a lot of people did find us through that. uh, We also had three articles written about us in the last week and a half. So KHOU, a couple days prior to the video, had also written an article about us. Our alumni magazine, I guess, through Full Sail University that Byron and I both attended, that's how we met, they covered us in their alumni success stories. 
And then uh, the Houston Chronicle covered us again in concert with our neighbor bookstore. Uh, there's a bookstore that's right next door to us called Kindred Stories. So the two of our shops were covered in the Houston Chronicle as well. And as a result, we had a ton of traffic last week, and it was really, really great. We also coincidentally had had our first two events at the new location. We had a food truck come out on Sunday called the Brunch Bus, which was like the best food ever. I was very excited about that. Uh, They came out, and so there's people who follow that Brunch Bus around, and because of that, they found us. But there was also customers of ours that order online only who follow the brunch bus who showed up and was like, hey, this is that comic book shop I order from online. So uh, we just had a lot of traffic because of that. And then Wednesday, we had our first official geek meet at the shop. And honestly, we would have been happy to have two or three people there, but we had like 15 people show up. And uh, so we just got to talk about nerdy stuff and cosplay and comic books and being black and brown and having representation and stuff like that. And it was, it was just a really, really, really good and exhausting week. Um, so that is the reason why the video part got delayed for the Patreons. But at least it got up there before the regular episode did. So anyways, that's what's been going on in my, my other life, my Gulf Coast life. And, um, and now we're just going to get into today's episode. Um, so I know last week on my solo episode, I did mention that, you know, we are in sort of financial trouble with um, the show and that I'm not really sure how I'm going to be able to keep it going if I don't find any form of sponsorship. And while the Patreon sponsors are the reason why it is keeping going, I don't want the burden to be solely on them from month to month to determine whether or not we can keep this show going financially. So I've been actively trying to find different avenues. I've petitioned for a couple of different sponsorships that um, I didn't get accepted for. And uh, so I'm just going to keep pushing. With the fundraiser that comes to a close tonight at 11.59 p.m. Central Time. So if you're listening to this on Tuesday, October 26th, you still have some time to order a Be Your Mix SL fundraiser t-shirt. We only sold, I think it's 32 or 33 shirts. Um, We got a couple more sales between last week's episode and this week's episode. But we're nowhere near the goal that we needed to finish out the year. So um, it's just going to be a little bit of a struggle. But I'll do my best to keep the show going for as long as is reasonable to do that. I have to consider the time and effort that I put in to the show versus not being able to survive (laughs) and not being able to pay the bills. So I don't want to bring this episode down. You know, I already talked about it last week, but things are a little bit tough. So that's just the state of things. Uh, For those of you who do want to help keep the show going through Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash militantlymix and sponsor the show as low as a dollar a month to as high as anything you wish. And as long as you submit at the uh, subscribe at the $5 level, you can get access to the video versions of the episodes starting with episode 142. And so you can see what it's like to do what what an episode, what an interview looks like when I'm on uh, StreamYard with our guests. If you don't want to commit to a monthly or an annual sponsorship, but you do want to put some coins in the tip jar, you can go to paypal.me slash mix and donate to the show that way. And that doesn't have a reward level or anything like that. It just allows you to contribute to the show if you if you want to support us and keep us going. Um, in addition to that, we always have merchandise on the website on militantlymix.com on the merch tab, which are mostly logo tees and mugs and totes and things like that. The Be Your Mix I Self t-shirt is going to get pulled at midnight or 11.59 p.m. Central Time today. Uh, after that, I might release that image in a different form, like maybe stickers or mugs or totes. But in in terms of the t-shirts, you know, that is the annual fundraiser t-shirt. It lasts for about a month and um, we did what we did with it. So I'll I'll consider putting it up. I've been thinking about it because the design is so good. I don't really want it to to disappear entirely. But at the same time, the fundraiser t-shirt is an exclusive um, and for a short period of time. So that's why we do what we do. Uh, let's see what else. I really don't have anything else to report. I mean, besides how well the shop is going and how I'm trying to transition out of my part-time remote job and into full-time comic book shop mode, that's pretty much what's going on. I'm tired. I'm like stressed out. I, 
I work seven days a week and I'm just trying to find a way to balance my life out a little bit. So <sighs> that's pretty much it. So let's get into today's episode. Uh, like I said at the beginning, uh, our guest today is Sadie. Uh, they're an actor from Toronto area of Canada, and uh, we had a really good talk, and I really do hope you enjoy it. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our latest cousin to the Militilly Mix family, Sadie. <laughs> This week is Sadie, and we, I, I, you've been on the list for a while, I think. I think you've been sitting on the list. It's taken me a while to catch up on the Be A Guest list, but why don't you introduce everybody to your, introduce yourself to everybody, and let's get into it. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Sadie Fay. I identify as a brown and white Canadian, and I am an actor and intimacy coordinator. Uh, explain intimacy co- coordinator to us. Yeah, totally. So uh, an intimacy coordinator is very similar to a stunt coordinator. So on a film set, a stunt coordinator's job is to oversee the stunt, make sure that it looks realistic, but also more importantly, make sure that everyone involved is safe while doing it. And so an intimacy coordinator does the same thing, except for intimate scenes. So that could be simulated sex, could be a kiss, could be a scene where someone's alone and naked. Uh, So it's my job to be an advocate for the actors and make sure that their boundaries are being adhered to and respected on set. I don't know why that got me a little emotional just thinking of it, but having worked in the film industry and seeing what that has been like, I I even was on a set behind the camera during a a performed rape scene and I couldn't deal with it and I was behind the camera uh, or I wasn't behind the cameras, you know behind everything um so it's nice to know that 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 position exists because i've definitely never been on a set that had it yeah um that's awesome how'd you get into doing that thank you yeah um it's definitely long needed i think everyone has an unfortunate story of something that's gone wrong or that felt gross on a set so in um june of 2020 i just saw the term intimacy coordinator and i was like I don't know what that is, but that's for me. And then I, <laughs> I Googled it and then I got mad. Like, how come I didn't know this existed? Like, I'm an right. actor and I, why did no one tell me about this? And then I just sort of immediately started training and I got certified in um, February of 2021. And uh, I've been doing, um, still doing trainings and workshops because it's so interesting and there's so much to learn. Um, and I just had my first day as an IC on set. Um, just a few weeks ago, actually. Awesome. Congratulations. I, I, I do think uh, protective roles, protective positions in companies are so important to know that there are people that are able to do something like that, especially on a film set, because I mean, you sometimes you are you're you're naked or you're intimate with someone you're not even part you, you, you hardly know, you know, you may have met them right before your scene and things like that. And that can be triggering if you've experienced any kind of sexual assault in your past and stuff like that. So that's amazing. I did not know that position existed. Um, I thought you were going to say something totally different when you, when I asked you to describe it. Um, that's amazing. Thank you. So you, uh, so you said you describe yourself as a brown and white Canadian. Um, how, how did you come to that part of your identity? How, uh, what is, what makes you get to brown and white? Canadian? Yeah, because. Uh, I was sick of where are you from? Where are you really from? Where are your parents from? Okay, but where were they born? And then yep. when I finally get there, and then when I finally like give them the country they want, they're like, eh, I don't think are so. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. I was like, okay, so invalidation, 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 invalidation. Yeah. Invalidation. <laughs> yeah. And I, I felt like I could never, well, firstly, I felt like I could never claim any of these countries because nobody believed me. But also, sure. I, I'm, I don't really have any of the culture of like any of these places outside of Canada. I mm. like my culture is Canadian. Both my parents are quite culturally Canadian. And so that's who I am. And I feel like skin color and culture are, are not the same thing 
But right. some pe- sometimes even hearing brown and white Canadian is hard for people because they're like, well, if you're brown, you must not be Canadian. But mm. what? Right. Yeah. Um, th- there's a lot of similarities in the States to the way that people feel like even though it's the colonizers that came here and took land from brown people, somehow it's impossible to believe that even brown people, indigenous brown people, but brown people from anywhere it's like, I don't understand. What do you mean? You're from here. You're clearly not. So are you, how many generations do you think, do you, do you know how many generations you are of, of both sides of the immigration? Yeah, my dad, uh, my dad was not born in Canada, but he came to Canada when he was three months old. Okay. So he like, he grew He's up. He's Canadian. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, he yeah. did um, live outside of Canada for a little bit during his childhood, but you know what I'm doing? I'm purposefully not saying the country is right now. And I've been asking myself leading up to this podcast, do I want to say the countries on the podcast? And part you of don't me, have to. you know, yeah, part of me is like, no, because I stopped saying that because I didn't like how people responded. But then part sure. of me is like, well, that's sad. And like, this is the place to say it, if any well, place. And I it, it's wanna, about your comfort. You know? It's really about your comfort. And it's about claiming the identity on your own terms, right? So if if for your comfort, you've had to, cre- you know, create this this terminology and you want to exist in it and you want to feel comfortable in it, do that. If you if you want to think of militantly mixed as the place of like, well, of all places, I'll go ahead and do it here. But if it makes you feel like if you think it'll make you feel any kind of way, there is no pressure. Your identity is your identity. And no one no one is supposed to (laughs) tell you how you're supposed to identify. But I, you know, I want you to claim it and own it the way that you feel comfortable in claiming and owning. So you're under no obligation. If you want to see even if it has an experiment, you want to see that you could go through it without fine like honestly you're be your own mix so thank you so much you know what i still haven't decided so let's just keep going let's and then keep, we'll see if i say it right and maybe I won't. <laughs> um no yeah i honestly I'm, I'm a little curious about just that kind of claiming i think one of the things that that i experience on the show talking to people is is whether or not i i wonder sometimes are they telling me what they're telling me because they think I need it in a certain way or that I want to hear a certain way. But, you know, the motto of the show is be your mixed ass self. And whatever that means to you is what I mean. You know, I recently started referring to myself as Blasian, not because I technically am comfortable with that identity, but because it's a little bit quicker shorthand for people than me having to explain I'm Black and Japanese and you know, technically also Caucasian British, but then my cultural identity is black and Japanese and the, but also I'm American, but I have some British, you know, I don't want to have to go through it all the time. So it's sometimes for a protective measure so that I don't feel like I have to explain it very far. Blasian is how I'm doing it right now. But that's selective too, for me of when I choose to do it. So you are yeah, you, you own it the way that you want to own it on this show or in your life, either way is is important. Thank you very much. Is it is it still constant then? Like even to within the last week, you've experienced some version of that kind of a, a disenfranchisement of your identity. You is know, it just- it's weird because in COVID, it's kind of stopped, and it's because I'm not like meeting strangers on the street <laughs> anymore. Yes, like I get a lot of strangers uh, doing the like, "What are you for?" Just like you know, I I don't meet any as many new people as I used mm-hmm. to. Um, but I'm still. It's also been within COVID that I really started to explore what it means to be mixed. And it's only really in the last like year and a half that I've started really claiming it and being loud about it. I Mm -hmm. think I didn't learn the term mixed race, which is I said brown and white Canadian, but mixed race is like my other preferred term. Um, I didn't learn the term mixed race until I was 18. And Mm -hmm. I didn't know that there was like a word or what I was until I was 18. And I used to starting from age four, I referred to myself as a as a swirl cone. Like I would mm-hmm. say that my dad was chocolate ice cream, and my mom was vanilla, and I was a swirl cone. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's really cute for a four year old. And I think that's sad it's a way for to anyone get to older. It. Yeah, 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 that like, that I didn't know what I was, or that there was a word or that like, no one mm-hmm. taught me. Um, yeah. So it took me a long time to really a learn what it was. And then just in the last year, realize, well, there are other people mm-hmm. like this, and there's a community and a shared experience. And I'm part of something and I belong somewhere. Right. 
Yeah. I honestly, I think um, what I found to be very common on this show is that it's usually around like the third or fourth grade, like eight to 10 is kind of the pocket where a child realizes they have a deal, like whatever that is. In my case, it was a, a pro- school project where it was like um, the end of the school year. So they wanted us to make our Father's Day cards, even though Father's Day was going to be after school was over. And we were supposed to bring a picture of our fathers to school. And so that's how my little friend that I was, that I had knew I had a black dad. Um, And then the next day she told me she wasn't allowed to hang out with me anymore because she told her dad, Charmaine has a brown dad. I don't understand, you know, and um, that was how they chose to deal with it. So the way my mom chose to deal with that moment when I come home to ask her, you know, what does this mean? Um, It's not like I didn't know my parents were different colors. It's just that what do I need to do with that? I don't need to do anything with it at that, at that young age. Um, but when it became, when it came to my doorstep where it was like, now you need to know about this, that, that was, my mom did better in explaining racism to me than she did in explaining mixed race ness to me. Mm. So all of that still had to come on my own. And, and, and while I was younger, when I started referring to myself as mixed, um, it was just part of the black culture here in the States where I lived, uh, you know, we were the mixed ones. So I at least knew that. But um, did I know what it meant? I don't know that I 100 percent knew what it meant until I got a little bit older. And it's really hard. Like parents don't know how to talk to their children about what they did to them in creating these little mixed. <laughs> I don't feel like my parents ever taught me about being mixed. And in fact, I feel like I have taught them what mm-hmm. it is. And only like really in the last year, I, I, I didn't grow up with like both my parents, though. And mm-hmm. I think that made it harder for me. Like my parents divorced when I was two. And they're still both in my life and I'm still close with both of them. It's just that I lived with my mom growing up Mm -hmm. and I actually haven't lived in the same city as my dad since I was eight. Mm. So we're so close. It's just like he's by like distance been in my life less. Right. And so the visibility of like friends coming to my house or um, what my family looked like, like when I was a uh, when I was 10, my mom got remarried to a white man who had two white daughters. So mm-hmm. suddenly I was in a family of five with two stepsisters and everyone was white except for me. Mm. And like nobody said anything about it. They just left it alone, yeah. Yeah, so then I felt like I don't belong and no one's saying right. like kind of twilight zony. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that um I hope that that the way people are raising their mixed kids now is a little bit different. There's a little at least a few more resources available to people. Um but but yeah, they don't prepare it. And a lot of times they just think we're like them, whichever one that they are. But most of us don't look like well, I'm not gonna say most. It it happens to be the case in a lot of people's lives that have been on this show that they haven't looked like a parent that they've been raised with. And so it's not only the, you know, I don't look like my, my mom or I don't look like my dad, but also I don't have access to my mom or my dad's culture. So do I get to claim this identity, even though I'm so removed from it? And, you know, I want to say, yes, you can claim it, but I also know that there's a lot of gate keeping and there's a lot of barriers to us being able to to find the ways to embrace us. So that's why I do say things like be your mix ass self, meaning like claim your comfort level. And guess what? That's going to change because if you only learned the term mix at 18 and now as an adult, you're using brown and white, you know, five years from now, you might be claiming the actual countries and being like, you going to say something about it? You know, you, you just never know of what it's going to be. I, um, like I said, my, I recently started to claim the terminology for Blasian. And really, it has most of, more to do with the fact that Naomi Osaka and uh, Ryu Hachimura exist. These are two Black Japanese people that don't quite look like me, but um, they're the closest to my racial identity and racial makeup that I've that I've experienced in like celebrity form. And so people are accepting them as Blasian. So, all right, I'll explain that because then they'll think of them when they see me and I, I have less to explain. So I think I think the way that you're getting through it is the way that you it's just it's just a path like you'll you'll end up altering it at some point because either the world will teach you something else or you will just be tired. (laughs) 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 I mean, it's like I'm exhausted. I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, So you did say that you don't really have either of your parents cultures. And so generally you're just a Canadian, whatever that means for for you. Right. Yeah. So my mom is like fully 
culturally Canadian. And I want to be clear, I'm talking about like settler Canadian identity. We're not indigenous. We do come from people mm-hmm. who benefited from genocide. And it, that's something as Canadians, that's very important to work, for us to work through, regardless of what our mm-hmm. skin color is. Um, so my mom, yeah, my mom is Canadian and that's her culture. My dad, also Canadian. I think he does have like the like it's interesting i don't think i've ever really asked him i wonder how he would answer this question if i'm answering Mm -hmm. for him because he's not here (laughs) i would say he has the like um immigrant experience of Mm -hmm. like um having parents with different cultures um coming to canada um and then like they came to canada when he was three months old so he grew up i guess immersed in canadian culture but also with this this different culture happening at home Yeah. Yeah. yeah Um, and he did go to live in the country that he was born for a, about a year or two when he was in grade school. I think I have talked to his mom about this. And it's interesting because, um, oh, I'm like, should I just say the countries? I'm just, I'm going to do it. I'm going to say the country. Uh, totally up to you. And if at the end of it, you're just like, I'm going to, I'm not ready, then I'll go ahead and cut it or oblivion. You know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to claim it. PSA for anyone listening. Don't come at me like, well, you're not from there. <laughs> yes, I am. Okay. I mean, so. if it happens to you with our audience, then we got a different problem. <laughs> we got a totally different problem if that happens. You're right. So thank this is, yes. Thank you, everyone. I love this podcast. Okay, here we go. <laughs> my dad was born in Kenya and um, my family were um, Indian people living in Kenya. So okay. A couple le- levels of yeah, so culture it's, and immigration. Yeah, yeah. So, and they had, my family had been living in Kenya, as far as I understand, for like five or six generations. Oh. Um, my dad's mom, uh, I recently asked her how she identifies. Does she identify as Canadian, as Kenyan, or as Indian? And she said, none of the above. She mm. identifies as a smiley, which is her religion. And if oh, okay. she was going to, like... <laughs> pick an identity that feels most like her if she had to pick one that's the one she would pick so that was really interesting to me to hear her say that is that um like village based or or tribal based in in a way too associating with the religion that way uh i don't know it's it's my reason is a sect of islam um and i know that um that's like still really important to her and she's still um practices i would call her one of the most religious people in my family um Mm -hmm. and i i'm really interested that to her um her like culture and identity comes from her religion because i'm not religious and neither is my dad Mm -hmm. and so sometimes i feel like if i was ismaili or if my dad was i would get to like claim this culture more Mm -hmm. or i'd be like more valid or like more i'm using air quotes more of a brown person Sure. Um, if I had this culture, um, or if I had any language, um, right. she speaks like five languages, I think. And I don't <laughs> think she passed any of them down. Well, you just hit on the greatest hits of all of us mixed kids who have removal from whatever cultures that we come from is that there's a cultural removal. There's a, a, a religion removal in some cases, there's certainly a language removal in, in most cases. And then there's just like the home terra, the ground, you know, like the the thing that makes us feel like this is where we're from thing that we, I think as Westerners probably experience pretty heavily, or at least I, I do. Like I feel, a, a, I, I call it sometimes like a mourning or like a grief for what we didn't have. So, you know, I've never been to Japan. I've never been to Gabon, which is where my African ancestry comes from. I have been to England. And in very weird ways, that felt comforting, even though it was white people who didn't understand why I looked the way that I looked. And yet I was claiming to be cousins with this white guy that looked like they did, you know. Um, So I think I I think, you know, those all things at play at all times for us, there may never be a time where we properly feel like we can claim the things of of what what our heritage is from. But I, what I don't want any of us to feel like is that we don't have permission to try mm-hmm. or to acknowledge. So I do a couple different things. I describe myself as hierarchically mixed, where I say like I'm black first because that's my primary culture, and then I'm Japanese and then British. And there's certain, and I say British specifically, not English, because the 
person in my family that was from England was very British. And what I got from her was Britishness, not Englishness, you know, necessarily. Um, she's Welsh and English too. So there's that, that thing at play going on. So what I like to say about this is that um, these are all the things that I'm made up of. Boom, 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 boom. Here's the cultural aspects that I am close to. Boom, boom, boom. And here's what you get to call me. Boom. You know what I'm saying? So like you're just not granting people the permission to even try to claim it for you or tell you what you're allowed to claim. Even if they come from the same cultural group that or heritage group that you come from, it's like, yes, you come from it and you're a little bit more immersed in, let's say, the religion aspect of it than I am. But guess what? You can't tell me that that's not my dad. You can't tell me that's not my grandmother. You can't tell me that the people that they come from aren't the people that I come from. So, yes, I claim this and I, you know, I say it with my chest. This is where I'm from. Um, That being said, I think being sensitive to certain things about like, in my case, as a descendant of the transatlantic slave trade, I do say that my ancestor, my African ancestor is from Gabon because we happen to know where we came from. But I don't know how many generations far back that is. And I absolutely do not have any um, Gabonese culture. So all I know is that I want to visit. I want to see if I feel at home. I listen to the music and I do things like that to give me some access to the culture. And even though I'm not going to walk around calling myself Gabonese, I'm going to say, but I'm from there. My people come from there. And so I, I have claimed to, to that heritage like anybody, like anybody else. And again, it's just a, it's a question of when we stop letting other people validate us. Totally. You know, that, I think- that's the hard part. Yeah, I think even in in saying like I'm culturally Canadian and I have nothing else. I think that's come from a lot of people telling me I'm not brown enough to be brown, but I think right. sometimes and it is true. I'm I'm Canadian that that's the cultural yeah. experience and though, okay. but I'm also I do have elements of not Canadian and I sometimes I sort of gaslight myself into them not mm-hmm. existing. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, we all do it. Um, like, you know, the earlier I said dad's mom, I didn't say grandma because I don't call her grandma, but I feel like the word that I used to call her, I can't say out loud. And it's confusing because I call her Nanima, but which anyone who, you know, growing up, um, the other kids were like, what's a Nanima? Like, and then that hurt because I, I was like, well, you have a Nana. It's like the same thing, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But Nanima is like, in terms of language, the wrong word. Like nanny mom means your mom's mom and she is my dad's mom. So like oh. either someone's not going to know what that word means and they're going to be like, what do you mean? Or someone is going to know what that word means and they're like, why are you using the wrong word? <laughs> so, but again, <laughs> like somebody gave you that language to use. So yeah, I the mean- reason that I call her nanny ma and not daddy ma, which means dad's mom is because a, she thinks Nanny Ma sounds nicer and that's what she wanted to be called and I honor that. But B, her mom was called Nanny Ma by the whole community because mm-hmm. she was such like a like a Nanny Ma figure to everybody. And so it was that's... kind of like a mantle that she wanted to inherit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that though. Yeah. But again, I, I can see it in you and I can feel it and not to get all auntie on you or anything like that. But like, I can feel you apologizing while you're talking. Uh, I am. And, um, and I, I 100%, I get it. Like we, we all do. It. I'm, I'm less there now because I have a show like this where I'm constantly immersed in this, d- these kind of discussions. But, um, but it happens to me too. Like 100%, it happens to me too, where I'm not Japanese enough in a Japanese space or, or even now I've, I, like I, lived in a Japanese community and I did not feel Japanese. Now I live in a black community and I'm apologetically telling people I mix a lot and I'm militantly mixed. I'm, I'm mixed girl Maine, you know, so don't feel bad, but just know that like, you don't have to, you just have to remind yourself, you don't have to apologize about that. And honestly, the story is beautiful as to the reason why you call her what you call her. And uh, it's same with me. Like my Japanese grandmother wanted to be called gram- grandma. I wanted to call her Obachan because that's what all the other Japanese kids got to call their grandmothers. But my grandmother wanted to be American. So I honor the fact that she wants to be called grandma because that's what she wanted. And, um, but if I talk, but I code switch it. So if I talk to other Japanese, I do refer to her as Obachan. But 
um, when someone will ask me something and I'll accidentally slip into calling her grandma, then they're like, oh, do you have another? And I'm like, no, no, no. She just likes, oh, oh she likes it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think that's a, I think it's a sweet story and it's a family story and it's personal. So everybody else can shut up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I was apologizing. <laughs> I will stop. I have an anima, an anima. You're probably listening because I told you to. I love you. Um, <laughs> There we go. I'm sorry that when I was a kid, I called you Nana because I was embarrassed. Oh, well, also, when we're kids, what do we know? Right. Like, we're just trying to figure it out. It's you go through the you go through the steps. I think there was a few times I even called my grandma Bachan, too. And I remember her look and being just like, oh, disappoint disappointment as punishment is enough for me. I never needed anything else. So it's like, <laughs> oh, no, never again. I apologize. I'm sorry. And you'll never hear me say that again. Um I I called her Nana for a long time. I don't know if I called maybe to her face, maybe Nanny went to her face, but when referring to her, I, I, no, probably to her face. I called her Nana for a long time. And it wasn't until my younger sister was born and she started calling her Nana that I realized that I had, I felt like I'd stolen something from my sister. And then I went back to Nanny Ma and now, now we call her Nanny Ma. Yeah. That's awesome though. And, and honestly, I think the more of us that exist out loud, um, the less that the people who try to invalidate us have room to invalidate us. I think the feeling out loud, you said, I think the feeling is like, Oh, I have to, I'm mixed, but if I'm mixed, I have to be perfectly mixed, but it's messy. Like it's not different. It's messy. I'm unique. And like, it's not easily explained, but that doesn't mean that I'm like less of a human. I think. Yeah. I mean, I think about it like this and um, I have four different accents that I speak depending on who I'm speaking to and what the circumstances are. And sometimes my code switch putters into another space a little bit and then someone realizes oh my gosh you actually sound like blah 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 and and then I you know I used to be really oh oh you know I'm sorry I was uh, thought I was at home for a second or something like that right but I just stopped doing that and a lot a lot of it had to do with the show I mean I do have an, an advantage that I guess a lot of my listeners probably or guests probably wouldn't have because I literally talk about this every single day. Um, so it's a little bit easier for me to get, you know, make those changes quicker, um, I think, than others. But um, as a as a mixed person, I feel like we have to live out loud. Like, well, those of us who can comfortably, we have to live out loud and, and super loud so that people leave you alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and then hopefully if they learn to leave you alone, they'll learn to leave the next mixed person they encounter alone. Yes. Um, this is actually, you've nicely segued into something that I really wanted to bring up today, okay, which go. is something that I recently saw in myself and I was shocked and scared and now I don't want to do it and ever again. And that is assuming that everyone I meet is monoracial, which mm. I do. And then I, and then I found out that some of my friends were mixed and I didn't know because I had just assumed they were monoracial. And then I felt so bad because I hate when people do that to me. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that everyone always, well, that's, that's, I won't say everyone, but <laughs> myself. And I think most people frequently, almost all the time, assume that everyone else is monoracial and right. let's stop. And the reason let's stop is because mixed people can look like anything and we look like anything and you can't tell. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that I've noticed, even like, especially you mentioned earlier, like COVID not really seeing people. Um, one of the benefits of COVID for me was like in terms of sexual harassment on the street was that people stopped asking me to smile oh, because yeah. I have a very, I grew up in, in the hood. So I have a very walking down the street, don't mess with me face, even though I literally could not back it up if I tried. But because my face looks like that when I'm walking down the street, people tell me to smile a lot. Well, it doesn't happen anymore because of masks. So I get to just kind of exist on the street without much attention. The, but what has happened that I never had happened to me before is now I'm coded as East Asian for the first time in my life. And I'm 40 mm. years old. And most of the time, if someone thinks I'm Asian, they think I'm Filipino because I'm browner and I don't quite look like the stereotypical East Asian. And so, you know, I would get like, oh, you must be Filipino or something like that. But when I wear the mask, for some reason, my hair, I also shaved my hair last year. So it was, it was like spiky and I was giving off super East Asian boy vibes. Um and uh, so now people are identifying East Asian in me. And so for the first time in my life, I'm having this identity crisis of embracing that I look 
potentially East Asian to people. And, um, and it's because of the assumptions of other people that I'm sitting there having like a crisis of what do I look like and stuff like that. I'm allowing other people's visual opinion, opinions of my visual presentation to impact me. And I think, yeah, like, I, I mean, I'm guilty of it too. I, I almost, this is the, this is the worst thing I'm about to admit as, as militantly mixed hosts and stuff like that is that I'll go so far as to just assume people are multi, mo, uh, monoracial so that I don't, upset somebody for accidentally assuming that they're mixed Mm. because somehow I've centered that experience over how it would just be nice if someone be like you're mixed right and that's like that could be all they say and I'd be like thanks yeah thank you for seeing my ambiguity right Uh, but let's say like a monoracial appearing or assuming black person and I didn't know that they had a white mom and I just go ahead and assume that they they're not mixed. And then all of a sudden I find out later that I'm like, dang it, I didn't say it because I didn't want to offend you if you were monoracial, but instead I didn't see, you know, so yeah, I, I, that happens for me too. I I'm also guilty of that. I think this um, point of like not assuming monoracialness or that mixed people can look like anything was really struck home for me when um, l- last year I did a, um, I was calling it a racial healing group through Mixed in America. And uh, so that there was like, I think uh, four or five of us and the two um, founders of Mixed in America. And we just met, I think it was four times and we talked about being mixed and that was like my first time really talking about it with other mixed people but every single one of us talked about feeling like we don't look mixed enough like there's a mixed look that uh, yeah. as, I think monoracial people especially have this idea of what a mixed person looks like, like we're just split right down the middle and yeah. it's like oh clearly your brown like, is visible and clearly exactly and that we all felt like we didn't look mixed enough and that was so sad to hear that like of course we do like we're this literally is how you came out. Yeah. 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 and instead of um I just this is my PSA to everyone because it's my PSA to myself <laughs> is just stop assuming people are monoracial makes people can look like anything and you look mixed enough no matter what you look like it's so funny that you say that because I I occasionally I'm as a queer person too um and I I do have a husband so I get straight assumed often and my reaction to that is usually like ew even though technically I'm in a heterosexual relationship. Um, it's just like the idea of being assumed to be straight freaks me out. But there's stuff like that that I almost want to do just generally to random people too, like especially white people to just be like, what do you mix with? I'm like, wait, I was like, yeah, well, what kind of white? Like, where, where are your parents from? No, where are your grandparents from? And, you know, I've done that on occasion. And sometimes it is to be caustic because I'm catching a vibe that's telling me you deserve this punishment of, un- of uncomfortableness. Um, but sometimes it really is just to make people aware of like you know you guys do this to us a lot you assume uh, things about our presentation you assume things about our cultural access the worst thing for me is when I tell someone I'm black and Japanese and it's a you know a white person that speaks Japanese and suddenly they're speaking Japanese to me and then judge me for not speaking Japanese and it's like you don't know my life like my grandmother I, I don't want to tell some random stranger that is judging me look my grandma didn't teach me Japanese because the military told her it's bad enough. Your kids are half breeds. Don't confuse their brains in the fifties. And that she never repaired that fear, you know? So me not speaking Japanese is actually important to my grandmother. Mm. Sucks for me, but Mm. for her, when I started to learn Japanese in school, it freaked her out because she's worried about something that was told to her 40 years earlier. Um, you know, so I don't want to have to tell that to some random stranger. Yeah, and you don't know anyone that. Right? Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, there's things like that. Like, you don't want people to make assumptions about you, but also they don't know what damage that they're causing in even asking these questions of you or making these assumptions about you. And um, so I say, if it happens to you, turn it back around on them <laughs> because they should be uncomfortable uh, for doing what they did. But also it's just like making sure it doesn't penetrate you. Right. Mm. That's the hardest thing. We're so easily impacted by the views of others and us not looking mixed enough. I mean, I like I used to say, I still kind of do sometimes. I'll say something like, Oh, I wasn't stirred up all the way. As if I'm not <laughs> enough, you know, distributed. Um, and I'll be like, you know, because if you look at like my face, it's like Japanese here and <laughs> 
black hair, but I have this yellow, yellow brown skin, you know? So I was like, I'm not startup enough. And I used to think that was cute, but then there's times when I hear it, I hear myself saying it and I'm like, oh, you know, I'm letting, I'm centering other people's experience of what I am supposed to look like. Mm, Um, Yeah. Yeah. What we're supposed to look like. Totally. I, I am also a queer uh, woman dating a man and, um, when people I also hate when people just assume I'm straight and then if it's like well you don't look gay it's like I do look gay it's just you don't know what gay looks like I do look mixed I you just don't know what that looks like and now you please learn from this experience and now you know exactly. that, uh, there's a meme like. that I absolutely love and and then it became a tiktok later is that it says something like you don't look gay and then the person says oh hold on a minute and then they throw so the pictures the body throw it out like this and there's like a ring of rainbow around them <laughs> and like they're, they're receiving the rainbow um, but then now there's a lot of tiktoks where it's like oh you don't look gay like oh I'm sorry and then they just like cut and then all of a sudden they're just like all pride you know pride it out and stuff like that um I I enjoy that uh, I've seen people mix people do it too but they're using the audio of the you don't look gay and it's like oh you don't look like in Japanese or something like that and then they'll, they'll do it too um so I do I, I I'm basically old and tired at this point and in full-on auntie mode so I just want to make people uncomfortable it, for trying to make me uncomfortable all these years right um, or any of us like I'm I'm protective of the entire group of cousins out there that have to deal with this kind of stuff so and I think it blows my mind sometimes the things people say and then they don't feel uncomfortable right. saying them like right. I've had people be like oh where did you go on vacation and I'm like what and they're like, your skin, it's so... And then they do this thing where they're like circling their face with their <laughs> finger, just like looking at me, like, like oh, you know, your skin. That's not it's your like, natural skin color. You clearly have, you a, have tan. a tan. And I'm like, you just met me. <laughs> Why would you assume that I have a tan? You don't know me at all. Wow. Yeah, I was called a regular once um, by a woman who was wearing really dark sunglasses and didn't know that I was a person of color, I guess. And so as we were talking, she goes, wait, what? Because I clearly said something that made her realize I'm talking on beh- as a person of color. And then she goes, oh, are you a woman of color? And she tilts her glasses down, looks at me like this. And she goes, oh, you are. <laughs> I just thought you were a regular. Yeah. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> Oh, that's so I'm, gross. I based on people being a regular based off of what I look like. Um what? How? So yeah, people are gross. There's also it. um as an actor affects me um in terms of like casting because mm. just in my general life, whenever I meet someone, I never know how they're gonna see me. It's like kind right. of fifty fifty white or brown or sorry, white or exotic other um exotic no one ever knows but I never know if I'm gonna be like red as white or red as like other but then casting like I don't know how casting sees me and then that's interesting because like you know one casting director might see me one way and one casting director might see me another way or whatever um and I've had uh it took me a while to find an agent who would like listen to me when Mm -hmm. I said what I was and how I wanted to be cast and Mm -hmm. like just agree with that (laughs) um because I I had a meeting with one agent who told me oh yeah you know for we were talking I brought up race because I wanted to make sure I was you know going to be aligned and um uh, they told me for every role they submit one blonde one brunette and one ethnic Ew. Yeah, which is like, what? And as if white people aren't ethnic. Yeah, or as if <laughs> people of color aren't blonde or brunette. And oh, then right. like That's I was <laughs> talking to my friend at the time who was white and at the time she had green hair and she was like, I guess I'm the ethnic because my hair is Right, like what are the other options? Yeah. Goodness gracious. Yeah. yeah. So like just that like othering that people do. <laughs> It, it's it's funny, like that you mentioned the one casting agent may see you as one thing and not the and not the other. I, be, with the exception of the lady who thought I was a regular because she was wearing dark glasses, I've never been coded as white, even though technically I'm half white. Both of my parents are are white biracial. Um, my dad was black and white biracial. My mom was Japanese and white biracial. 
Um, so technically I'm half white, but I don't look like a white person. I don't, I don't, and I, I don't deal with the thing of people assuming that I'm, I'm white ever. I've never had that happen with, with the exception of the regular <laughs> thing. Um, but I, I've heard about this happening and it, it always baffles me because maybe I'm just more attuned to it because I see people and I'm mixed and I'm looking for ambiguity and things like that. But I get a lot of people who come on here and look completely racially ambiguous to me. And they'll be like, you know, because I'm white passing. And I'm just like, what? You know, like, what your face? Like, what are we talking about? Like, I don't understand what's happening here. Why do people think you, why do people think you're white? Or why do the people think you're, you know, why are they assuming you as white is a big question. So you probably do experience it where someone thinks they put you up for a white role and uh, someone will think they're putting you up for, I'm just going to make an assumption because I work in the film industry that they're going to put you up for some kind of Mexican very often. Yep. Get a lot. Well, <laughs> well, I don't like, I'm not comfortable playing like, uh, like Latina, even though right. I'm Latina all the time because I'm not Latina. And I think Latina roles should go to like Latina people. Right. Exactly. Um, so my current agent knows that. And you know, he's very good about it, but like mm-hmm. another agent that I really wanted to sign with and then couldn't because she was like, are you Latina? And I said, no. And she was like, well, I think you look Latina. So I will only send you out for Latina no, roles. No. Can you learn a Spanish accent? No. Which is like. I was going to ask that question next is, do you get asked to do accents? Yeah. Which is confusing because Spanish accent is, I guess, like Latina people have all different kinds of they have so many accents. Different so different what accents. even was that? Um, yeah. And I, I think a lot of people have told me like, wow, you're so lucky to be so ambiguous. Like the industry loves that and you're going to get so many roles because that's so great for you and congrats and I'm so jealous. Um, And the reality is that doesn't happen to me and people don't like, you know, like this person would only have cast me as Latina and I don't want that. And so I couldn't sign with her because she wouldn't see me as me. And so like that really frustrates me when people are like, you're so lucky. Oh, wow. It's like, well, Actually, no one can see me. So, yeah, I'd really honestly, I feel that too when someone says like you have the best of both worlds, or or like oh you're so lucky to be mixed because of you know something gross like that, where it's just the some kind of assumed thing, uh, which again is a it's like fetishizing or you know then I become a toy, right? Then then we're just like a, a toy for the monoracials to play with as they see fit um, in doing that. And I know uh, growing up in LA. Uh, any Spanish speaker that didn't, that wasn't Mexican was Mexican by association just because of a shared language. But they'd be like, well, what's wrong with your accent? Like, what part of Mexico are you from? And it'd be like, well, first of all, I'm from LA. And second of all, I'm Puerto Rican or, you know, something like that. Like it would be like my friends that come from any other country in the world. um, But for whatever reason would be viewed as Mexican, because even in LA, that's the only kind of Latin American diaspora person that they even understand it is unfortunate that too that all of us like we make jokes and there's probably a way more jokes about this in the early season the early parts of military mix which is what you're listening to right now compared to now is that uh every single person always said well like i'm i'm black and white but everybody thinks i'm latina or i'm i'm black and something else or i'm asian and something else but everybody thinks i'm like for some reason we all seem to look latinx in some way which is just another assumption i think or like just that like yeah i don't know yeah because if i gather together all of my friends that are from the latin american diaspora none of them look the same yeah exactly they they look as different from each other as my family who was all mixed of black white asian and latin american diasporic nobody like none of us look the same so i don't understand what why we all seem to be grouped into into that area and then i think it also is is kind of bad for for them too because then there's all these assumptions of what they're supposed to look like based off of what we look like and we don't come from their heritage yeah that kind of stuff is gross and in in the the acting industry and the in uh, production i used to well i used to mostly work in um unscripted because sometimes you get stuck (laughs) Um, but it would happen there too like in the casting of a particular show that I worked on for a couple of seasons like they always had to have you know a certain amount of white people um, at least one saucy fiery Latina an angry black woman and or an angry black man and um, you know and then you know like a brunette 
was your diversity. Like it's mostly blondes, but you get like a brunette or two and that's how you get your diversity. And if, and if I were to say the name of the show and you really thought about it, you'd be like, Oh yeah, every season, every season there, that's their makeup of the, of the thing, no matter where, what city that they're in, where they shoot and everything. So it's pretty, it's pretty unfortunate because if we don't fall into one of those categories, how do we, how do we exist? And then our options are really to colonize somebody else's role, right? Like making the decision to just, yeah, sure. My name is Johnny Depp and I'm going to play a Native American today, you know? Yeah. So I'm really thankful that my agent now um, listened to me and um, he is very clear about what I am willing to go up for. So I, you know, go up for white people. I go up for brown people. I go up for mixed people if they want to see a mixed person, but I feel like that's rare. I go out for the calls that are like general BIPOC. Um, I, where I don't go out is like when they're looking for a specific culture. That's not mine. So if they're looking for a brown person, but like specifically from Pakistan and they have that culture, then like don't send me because I don't or whatever, you know? So Yeah, it's not like filling the blank brown. Yeah. From a general region of people that probably all were once one, but now are different people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the same, like, uh, I mean, uh, I... I talk about I the other reason why I only I don't like to use Blasian until recently is because I like to distinguish the fact that I'm Japanese and not um, a different kind of Asian because of how many times people would be like, you're Chinese, right? Mm. And then tell me something about some random Chinese thing that they learned. And I'm like, great. Yeah, I'm not from there. So I don't know. How to <laughs> Um, so that, I guess that's the other reason why I don't necessarily like to go with the general thing, but the general thing has been easier for me to deal with lately and just be like, okay, fine. I'm just going to say Palatian out in public and then in private or on my show, I will be what I actually am. So when, okay, just side note, because it did come up a little bit. Some of the descriptions for the ethnically ambiguous casting role mm. is so gross. <laughs> Like the way that they describe an ethnically ambiguous. Oh, I mean, honestly, the way they describe any brown person, I think, is, is sometimes can be pretty gross. But um, yeah, I saw I saw an ad once that someone sent me because they're like, "You look ambiguous. Maybe you would like to try for something." And I was like, "I'm not really an actor." And then I read it and I was like, "Oh, now I just want to go just so that I can yell at people because of how gross the description is." Uh, but yeah, so sorry. Side note. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you live in Canada still or are you? Yes, I live in Toronto. Okay. Uh, which is a fairly diverse city, but also very segmented by the, the communities that um, the various of color communities that exist there as well. So you talk about access, right? You, you didn't really, you didn't feel like you were necessarily raised within the cultures of, of either heritage from however far back. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that it would be uncomfortable for you if you were to go to an event? Let, let's just say there happens to be an advertisement for an event that is for people of Indian ethnicity from Kenya. Oh, wow. That would be really interesting. Because um, there's know. a lot of people yeah. that have yeah. that. Um, that's a great question. I don't know. I Maybe if I was going like with a family member, um, I don't know. Like, Do you I, feel that it would be a comfort thing or a permission thing? Hmm. Permission. Comfort? Permission. Permission, probably. Yeah. <laughs> and is that, com is that permission that you feel like a person that you acknowledge is coming from that heritage grants you or that you have to learn to grant yourself? Probably that I have to learn to <laughs> grant myself is the right answer. I don't know. I'm looking, I'm in a closet I'm recording this from my cloth. Um, and I, I'm looking at a dress that I have that my, I had made. It was actually my nanny ma gave me a sari that was hers mm -hmm. and it was so beautiful. And I felt like, um, I couldn't wear it as a sari. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I had it tailored into a dress and it's a beautiful mm -hmm. dress and I love it. Um, and, I love it as a dress, but sometimes I wonder if I had given myself permission to wear it as a sari, what that would have felt like. Do you feel like in tailoring it, you kind of made it a mix of... I do feel like it's like a mixed race garment now okay. because it's like a dress that used to be a sari and that feels special. Mm -hmm. um, but I like I don't I don't know. I don't feel like I could ever go out and like buy myself a sari. I guess. What if what if you're you went with your nanima to... I think she would love that. <laughs> um I think that would be fun. Um, I don't know. I just feel like I think my fear is that people would be like, who's that white lady wearing a sari? You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. I also it's 
it has felt really hard never knowing how people are going to see me racially when I meet them um, because that's confusing. And I feel like every time I meet a new person, I'm kind of like on guard until I figure out how they think, who they think I am. Um, but also sometimes it feels like I'm going crazy. Like I live in a world that's not constant or, or something. I don't know. And like this for me is tied to, I feel like my skin color has gotten lighter as I've gotten older. Oh, we all fade. I don't know why it's so, it's so stressful for me because I've faded too. And um, I know I'm sitting in a room that the sun just went down. So now all of a sudden I'm just a bright circle of sweat. Oh, but yeah, I faded too. I, I don't know why we lighten up as we get older, but that it's really so does mess with identity. Feels <laughs> I feel like I look at pictures of myself as a child and I'm like, how did this brown child grow up to be a white woman? And I don't right. want to think that because I, I've i never, never once have I looked in the mirror and seen a white person. But mm-hmm. if I'm comparing my skin color, it has gotten lighter. So... I don't know. Yeah. I, I've recently been thinking about when my hair goes white. I think that will be hard for me because I think having dark hair, not that people of any race can't have hair this color, but mm-hmm. I do feel like having this hair kind of ties me to like, yes, I'm brown and I have brown it. hair. No, I understand that yeah. too. I, for me, it's a texture thing. Is my, my texture changes so often that I forget that I actually technically have hair closer to Japanese hair than, than black hair. Um, if I'm in a place of humidity, that's when it becomes obvious that I'm, that I'm mixed, you know? And, uh, and so when I shaved my head I, last year, I thought I was going on this like mixed black girl journey, but it turned out I was an Asian boy and I didn't know. Uh, and, and so like it messed with my whole identity, that and the fact that people were identifying me as East Asian because of my mask and because of my hair, um, it really kind of messed me up. And then on top of it, I've faded so much too. Like, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm going outside a lot, but I'm still not getting any darker. And this is just the color that I am now. And it's super pale. And I, I feel like there's a day like it would be it would be my nightmare for me I'll, I'll admit it it would be a nightmare for me if I woke up looking like a white person that being said um, a brown person with white hair sometimes looks super cool so you might find that you look more like your brown side when you have your white hair you who knows that would be nice yeah I think it's hard when like white people tan or either tan darker than me or just are darker than me because mm-hmm. it happens sometimes and then it's kind of like Ooh, look how dark I am. I'm darker than you. Ha ha. Oh, I hate that. Yeah. And then that's really invalidating. Like, I guess. Well, I guess brown can be so many shades. Brown can be so many things too. And and there are white people that do have like Mediterranean, you know, uh, genetics or or maybe you know Moorish genetics, but they were so far back that that's why they tan. But that's not why they don't look black or something like that. You know, that happens a lot. The the thing is, and again, I'll, I'll get all auntie on you again. It is 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 really about like we don't know how to not center outsiders. I don't know why we do this. I don't know how we get this training, but we all seem to suffer it. And so we're like, you've said it a couple of times too. It's like, I don't know how other people perceive me. And so like, I'm not willing to grant myself permission to wear the traditional sorry, because I think people are going to see me as a crazy white person. Right. Um, first of all, you don't owe them anything. Mm. So you could rock your sorry and be like, yeah, Say something. You know what I'm saying? Like it could be something that that you could do, but I wouldn't necessarily think that uh, you should just be that way. Like if if you're uncomfortable, you gotta you gotta deal with that until you're until you work yourself out of it, right? So I wouldn't push you out there. And be like, no, put on a sorry. You go out there right. because that's really validating of an experience when you're not ready for it as as not. Um, but to but to hear somebody else say, like, center yourself in that decision. And it may actually change the way that experience feels. And if you can get through the experience, not being worried about what the external person feels, you might find more opportunities of validation than you think you would mm. have access to before. Or you might be completely invalidated. And it, it's a question of how you allow that to penetrate you, right? Like, you know what? People thought I was a white lady, but it gave me an opportunity to talk about how proud I was of my brown culture, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it's about changing the narrative for yourself. And then once you change that narrative, things shift. Um, for many, many years, I thought of myself as a black girl who happened to be mixed. And then over time I became a mixed person who happened to be black because 
I centered the way the world saw me. When I grew up in a black neighborhood, I was black. No one ever questioned it. I was mixed, but I was black. And then I went out into the the non-black world, I guess. I, I went into the suburbs where there was predominantly white people. And all of a sudden, I had to explain why I looked and sounded the way that I sounded. And so I described myself as mixed with black. And now I'm back to thinking of myself as black that's mixed because... That's my major, that's my, you know, main culture. And that's where I feel the most comfortable. And yet I'm still apologetic sometimes about like, sorry, I know I'm black in a black space or mixed in a black space, but like, I'm, I'm super black, I promise, you know? <laughs> so it happens across the board, but you have to find little ways of like giving yourself that permission to not listen to other people or to not center the monoracial people or not center the person with the wrong opinion. Cause that's essentially what it is, right? If they're assuming that you're just white, or even if they're assuming that you're just Brown, they're not seeing your whole picture and they're making an assumption on your behalf. You tell them what they get to see you as not, not them. And it's, it's tough to get to that mindset of, of, not wanting to take up space. And the thing is like, we haven't taken up space for long enough. Gosh, that, that sense is a mess, but it makes sense. Yeah, you're right. We haven't taken up space for long enough. I, I think that's really interesting about centering ourselves or myself and my own what I want. I'm thinking of um, in like spring 2020, um, I got to be part of a Zoom call uh, that was just mixed people. There was like 70 mixed people on the call. Mm-hmm. And the moment I logged into the call and I saw all of these mixed faces, my first thought just kind of automatically was, oh, this is what white people must feel like. Yeah. Like to just be in a room of like people and you immediately know they're going to understand your experience. Mm -hmm. And that was such a shift for me. Like I am different, but there is a Mm -hmm. space for me. Mm -hmm. It is here. You're not different. Mm -hmm. You're the main character. I am the main character and I have my (laughs) own space. I think it was that I was, I spent my whole life trying to smush myself into white spaces or smush myself into brown spaces. And I never really fit in either. Mm -hmm. And I get to be the main character wherever I I am, but there's a mixed space and I can, Mm -hmm. I don't have to, I don't know. I get to be, I get to be mixed. I'm mixed and that's a thing. It's a real thing. Yeah. And and so one thing that I noticed too with doing this show, and then we'll start to wrap up, um, is that I, I realized I had more in common with mixed people in general than specifically looking for somebody who was mixed the exact same way that I was mixed because at that point that's my brother and my brother and I don't have the same identity you know he he definitely identifies more on the white side than I do and um so you know, like even we can't relate to each other but but generally I relate really well to other mixed people because we all deal with the where are you from know where are you really from where are your parents from where are your grandparents from are you sure that's what you are you know all of those gross things I know people are, from India and you don't look like any of them so you know what I'm saying <laughs> that is like yeah. <laughs> oh, okay so you've seen one particular kind of, of person from India and I don't fit that bill okay <laughs> so great yeah like that kind of stuff um, you know we all deal with these types of things and so we can relate to each other a little bit more and and the more you put yourself in those spaces the easier it'll be for you to learn how to center yourself and decenter outsiders in terms of their opinion of you and you know the other part too is that as 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 fan presenting people, we also have that problem of centering ourselves in a space as well, right? So you have multiple layers of things telling you you're not the main character, but you fucking are the main character. So like, you know, embrace that and and try to try to own that for yourself. Because I think when you stop asking for permission, you'll just be able to breathe and you won't even realize that all this time you were holding your breath. Thank you. you. Know. My takeaway from today is that mixedness is messy and complicated and beautiful and it can be all of those things and I don't have to make it neat and presentable yeah Yeah. and the thing is you don't owe anybody your identity you you decide who you reveal to and who you don't and it's your story you're the main character Uh, one question I do like to ask all my guests before before we go though is because it is so difficult sometimes and it is a real struggle for us to to be comfortable in our mixedness what is something that you love most about being mixed oh that's a good question um I like being beige I think uh (laughs) my skin is a beautiful color Uh, it's kind of I don't know beigey golden tanny brown (laughs) and I like it Um, I also this is gonna sound rude and I'm just gonna let it sound rude 
I think it's interesting. Um, and what I mean by that is when I see people like dating within their own race exclusively, I'm like, how boring. <laughs> also, I get a little bit offended. I'm like, oh, so you don't want me to exist? <laughs> you know, out of it makes people to exist. <laughs> um, which, it, you know, of course, if you find your true love and they happen to be the same race as you, that's fine. But also, like, just try it. You know, if you haven't, if you've only ever dated someone the same race as you, maybe, maybe just try it. <laughs> um, I have thought several times too. Like it's just a knee a knee jerk reaction that pops up is when I do see monoracial cu- couples, I'll just be like, "Oh, how sad for you!" Yeah. You know, just like you must be so boring. Like you said, like it's boring. Like you must like not have anything interesting to talk about. Like that kind of stuff. Yeah, the, I I don't always go the caustic route, but every now and then, and it's really when you catch a vibe from someone where they're clearly not for you um where i'll be like they'll be like oh no i'm just white and i'll be like oh i'm sorry <laughs> because they'll say stupid stuff to us too so sometimes don't do it to everybody because not everybody is that but you know if occasionally when the person will come up and ask me the gross thing that's when i'll flip it on them and be like oh gross that's weird how are you just that one thing was there no brown people in your area it's so weird uh but yeah just to be condescending and and things like that to show them that they're not the main character <laughs> another main character of my story well that's great i'm 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 appreciative of of you for coming on the show and sharing your story i i know that it is not comfortable sometimes and and we deal with a lot of self-doubt and things like that but taking this step and having these conversations are important i'm putting yourself in more mixed faces it seems like that's been really great for you so you know keep keep doing that and once you join once you're a guest on militantly mix you're one of our cousins so you know welcome welcome to the family cousin Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I I thought that I was going to come here and um, say all of the like mean things that people have said to me. And I didn't. And it's because it was more healing and more celebratory. Uh, and I wasn't expecting that. And I really appreciate it. <laughs> no, I you. mean, we need spaces like this. We, we absolutely do. Um, again, we have to work on not centering others in our mm. stories and and so healing is a big part of not doing, not centering the people outside of us. But why don't you tell everybody how they can find you, promote, 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 whatever it is that you got going on? Yes. Um, so please uh, follow me on Instagram at Sadie Fay Acting. That's S-A-D-I-E-F-A-Y-A-C-T-I-N-G. Same handle for Twitter. I also have a Facebook page called Sadie Fay Acting. And I have a website, www.sadiefay.com. Nice. Awesome. Um, I kind of want to hear more about intimacy um, consulting and stuff like that, because there's some just mad curious. So if you get a random message from me in the future, which that's pretty much because I've been thinking about it <laughs> since Absolutely. you mentioned it. Totally. I, I want to spread the word about it. So uh, anyone listening, if you have if you have questions about intimacy coordination, feel free to reach out. Uh, <laughs> that sounds like a commercial. <laughs> do you have do you have questions? About Has this intimacy? ever happened to you? <laughs> and now you have all these questions. <laughs> Militantly Mix is a main hustle media podcast produced and hosted by me, Charmaine Fury. Music is by David Bogan, the one. You can follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Militantly Mixed. If you'd like to become a sponsor of Militantly Mixed, please go to patreon.com slash militantly mixed for monthly sponsorship or paypal.me slash militantly mixed for a one-time only donation. And if you like what you hear on Militantly Mixed, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to be your mixed ass self. Main Hustle Media. Turn your side hustle into your main hustle.